Hi, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast. In case you're not familiar with us, the Diversity and Spirituality Network is an emerging community of people who are exploring the integration of diversity and spirituality. And we're about to change our name to Sacred Inclusion Network. We all have different opinions as to what all this looks like, but for me personally, I see sacred inclusion as nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. If you'd like to know more about us, please visit our website, diversityandspirituality.com. Today, it's my great privilege to interview Mark Silver, the founder of Heart of Business. Mark is a fourth-generation entrepreneur who's run a distribution business, turned around a struggling nonprofit magazine, and has worked as a paramedic in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's also a designated master teacher within the Shadhelia Sufi lineage. How'd I do, Mark? Is that good? <laughs> Not too bad. Shadhelia. <laughs> <Chattelia. laughs> <laughs> and he's received his Master's of, of Divinity with a specialty in ministry and Sufi studies. His heart of business mission is to support spiritually grounded marketing and business people who want to run a business in a small business, who want, who want to run a small business in a way that isn't slimy or insincere. And um, Mark, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm always delighted to spend time with you. And it's, it's so exciting that we're geographically close. I'm going to get to <laughs> yeah, go home closer. before too long. <laughs> so I know a little bit about your background. And, you know, for me personally, I never really made the link between spirituality and business. It was always, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but almost like a necessary evil. You know, um, you apparently have discovered the integration of the two and you did it early. So I'm wondering if you could tell me um, sort of how you, how you made that connection or maybe it's always been there. I don't know. Yeah, it certainly was not always there. <laughs> it was not always there. And, um, I remember years ago having a conversation with my dad, um, who uh, my mom and my dad ran uh, a store, a retail store in the Washington, D.C. area that my grandfather had started in the 30s, in the 1930s. And, um, and he had said to me, but, you know, you can't, you can't really pray to God for your business. Like he was, I'm like, <laughs> like well, you can, you can, you can ask for anything, you know? <laughs> and so, um, for me, um, the discovery of it was actually um, a little bit through the New Age doorway in that I was encountering, um, when I was looking to learn about business myself, I mean, I'd, I'd learned a certain amount, but then early, early I had a, a business coach and some other folks, and they were um, – applying these new age business principles to business. And I have to say that I was struggling with that teaching. That was something that didn't um, connect for me, but it kind of cracked open the door to, oh, spirituality, business. And then um, I was, uh, when, I, when I first started working, when I exited, I hope trying not to make this too long-winded, but as I exited the nonprofit world and, uh, and I started to kind of help friends of ours who were self-employed, um, I was realizing that so many of our friends who were self-employed had all this emotional stuff about business and they were struggling. And I said to my wife, Holly, I said, you know, I need some, and she'd been a healer, spiritual healer and body worker for a long time. Um, I need some way to process people, you know, it's like I'm trying to work with business things and they were getting stuck. And um, we ended up, uh, this is where it kind of intersected with the bit, you know, with the, with the Sufi work, you know, cause she started working with healer. This is getting long winded. It's hard, you know, it's hard to kind of piece <laughs> these together because it wasn't so direct. I mean, you're right. right. It's not something that's accepted in our, in our culture, or at least it, it didn't used to be, you know, it's like, it's become much, much more accepted. But you know, 20 years ago, when I was first starting out with this 1999, and it's now 2019, Heart of Business started in 2001. But my very first beginnings with this kind of stuff was was in 1999. And, and um, it was a very kind of uh, how we you know, it's almost not fair. I'm asking you, I'm asking you a linear question and life doesn't usually move that way. Um, it doesn't, but I, and so I just, but I wanted to honor the, 
because the question, because what happened was um, I eventually, like in the first encounter in a workshop with one of the Sufi teachers, at the end of the workshop where I'd had a very profound experience in my heart of opening and connection. And, um, and the teacher, uh, Ibrahim Jaffe explained that, you know, we use this healing, yes, for spiritual healing and yes, for medical healing, you know, busy, you know, like not, me- I mean, he was a doctor, so he could use the word medical, but it's like, you know, for physical healing, but we can also use it for relationships and we can use it for groups and we can use it for businesses. And I'm like, businesses. Yeah. You, you can like do healing on businesses and it kind of like crack this open. And when I went to do my initial three year training with my Sufi, with my Sufi teachers, one of the teachers there, um, uh, um, Paul Werder was the founder of Lionheart Consulting and had been doing work in corporations as a consultant for years. And he was helping to offer the specialty in that three-year training on business healing. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I can study business healing. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, that was kind of mind blowing for me. And so that's, um, that was kind of like the, the opening, like the first kind of doorway opening. And I'm like wanting to know how to just help people who were like, okay, well, let's talk about your business. And they're like, ah, emotions, emotions. <laughs> okay, how do I help you? I don't know how to help you. <laughs> it's like, and so, I, and so I had to get, I had to learn how to do that. And um, so that's really the pathway that opened it. And I, I just want to finish up because, uh, with, with this story by saying that what I came to realize through my studies with my teachers is that there is nowhere in the world that the divine isn't present, that the source of love isn't present. And so I try to correct both my thinking and the thinking of my students to say that we're not integrating business and spirituality. We're discovering what already is Mm -hmm. like it's already there. And in not recognizing it, we experience a disconnect because part of the reality that's already woven in to business when you're functioning as if you can't perceive that part of it, then it becomes very shallow and very um, heartbreaking, mm. really dysfunctional. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a direct question, but I, I guess I want to, since I'm doing all my full disclosure stuff about being a crappy businessman myself, I'll say another one. Um, you know, I had a, a teacher once who was, who was like a master at, at making money. He was really, really good, you know, but all the people in his sort of spiritual community they didn't get it at all. They thought he was like ridiculous, you know? Um, and I remember once I was consulting him, I was, I was with him, I, I was wanting to do some import exporting and he goes, um, you know, he wasn't even interested in talking about it. It was like, you know, he was only interested in spiritual business for him. Material business is like, it's just very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, that's a long winded way of, of saying that I imagine a lot of people that are attracted to, to your business and your, and your mission, uh, you know, they have some sort of sense, they have like an, an issue with, with this whole aspect of spiritualizing business or realizing that business can be spiritual. So mm-hmm. my question is, how would you distinguish the average person that comes into heart of business versus other whom I'll call material business type types. Mm. That's a really good question. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, so the goal of most of our clients, like the goal of, of my work is not to try to teach spiritual business. Like that's not the goal the goal for me is to help people who want to make a difference in the world, whose businesses really want to make a difference. Like I'm not evangelizing spirituality, right? It's like we all have our own pathways. Like some people are, you know, really drawn to go deep, you know, in one path or another or no path at all. Some people are not, you know, are, you know, carry love deep in their heart, but they're not really, you know, explicitly spiritual. Mm. You know, I, I, I find that um, we don't need to get caught in that. So I don't have a need for people to become spiritual, although I do have a need for 
a desire for as many people as possible to, you know, be connected to love, you know, and if you call that spiritual, you can, but, uh, um, but, and so for me, a lot of the people who come to heart of business, the way that they see the business world functioning feels so hard to their hearts. It feels so wrong to their hearts. Like they have this, there's what in my sense from my perspective is they're seeing something true about how dysfunctional and painful and destructive the world of business has become that they're unable they are unable to push themselves into doing the kinds of things that they see uh, you know that that are happening in mainstream business in order to make money and the few times that they maybe can push themselves into the edge of that and maybe they make a little money doing it or maybe they don't it just feels so bad to them they just can't go there and so what i what i'm trying to do to help them is to say this is how you can access this like this is how you can access business effective business with integrity with love by understanding mm -hmm. the presence of love that's already there mm -hmm. right it's like when you start to perceive the presence of love that's already there then it becomes a much it, your discernment about my client's discernment becomes much finer where instead of saying oh this is all gross they begin to be able to look at it more closely and say wow this piece is gross but this piece actually i can see how love can be present in it and i can see how to approach marketing in a way or business growth in a way that feels good and I can feel confident that I can reject this piece without mm -hmm. it um, necessarily uh, undermining my attempts to develop my, mm -hmm. business, my business. Well, there's a lot that I want to discuss. And I, I, I realize as I'm doing this that I, I wanted you to have you um, leave us in a little invocation sort, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I still want to stop and do that for a minute. And that maybe that'll deepen our conversation. So mm -hmm. I know that in your, in your regular practice, you do these 15-minute um, remembrance things, which, of course, is not appropriate in a situation like that. But I think <laughs> if, <Right. laughs> it would be useful. It would help me anyway um, mm -hmm. if you would just um, maybe any may, – maybe um, – for lack of a better word, bring love to this conversation so people can, um, people can hear us. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, let me preface the invocation um, so people can understand where I'm coming from because I am, um, uh, you know, I am a Sufi teacher designated in my lineage, and um, and I find that the invocation, like when we have meetings in our business with my team members, as well as when I teach classes, I always start at least with a little invocation and often with a more extended invocation because what it does for me is it just helps me remember it's so easy to get mm -hmm. tunnel vision oh my god i'm looking at these numbers oh my god i mean I, this morning i know i'm delaying the invocation but i just want to say this piece is like i woke up this morning and i was so cranky oh my god mr cranky pants as we say <laughs> my um and um and I realized what was going on is like, I, there's, so, there's a lot of details. Mm. I've got a lot of details that I'm handling logistically, administratively. You can't see it on camera, but I've got all these papers on my desk that need to be filed and dealt with. And, um, and I just was kind of, and we recently moved to Harrisburg and like our monthly bills. I'm like, hold it. What, what, what's, what do we owe when? Like I've just haven't sorted through all of that because it's been, such a short period of time and I was trying to get really cranky and I realized like this is what happens one example of what happens in life is I get so tunnel visioned mm -hmm. that I forget that there's a larger reality right mm -hmm. it's like business it's like a this is like a small example of what I was talking about before it's like the divine is already present mm -hmm. and the invocation is not bringing the divine in it's reminding me mm -hmm. and hopefully reminding others of the larger reality that is already here. It's already here. So in my tradition, one of the, the, the way that I tend to do invocations is I always start just by breathing and coming back to my physical self. Mm. And then I start with a little Arabic phrase, which means protect us from evil in the name of the one most compassionate, most merciful, most kind. And so I say it in Arabic first, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of the one most compassionate, 
most merciful, most kind. I ask in the name of oneness to help our hearts to remember that we are always guided, that our every step is guided, and that we need do nothing alone. Help to open the way and to reveal the path and to make the signs unmistakable. Help to bring nourishment and care and support in abundance. Help all of those who need the gifts that we've been given find their way to us without blocks or veils or hesitations. Make our provision easy. Mm. Ya yeah, Allah. Amin. Oh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for reminding us. You know, um, I have this little script of questions, but I'm going off script. Um, you know, I love this description, this um, distinguishing thing that you mentioned that you're not teaching spiritual business. It's, our, it's already here. The word spiritual is so loaded. What does it mean? It's almost like when I, when, I, when, I, when I think about your website and the people that I see you attracting, the common denominator is not so much that they're on a particular path. It's like they're trying to make a difference in the world. And maybe that's enough, you know. Um, we get so, uh, it's easy to get confused and distracted and um, create other um, kind of um, silos when we talk about spirituality and religion and all that. I think everybody could relate to love as, as something that we're um, wanting to experience more of. So anyway, I just wanted to say I really appreciate that, that um, sort of discrimination. Mm, thank you. Yeah. I want you to tell me a little bit about your Sufi lineage. You, you, you mentioned earlier that you had a couple of mentors um, in this, from this lineage that um, showed you um, – deepen your understanding of the connection between them. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about some of these teachers and maybe some of the lessons that they taught you. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, I first and form foremost will name um, my Sheikh, um, uh, uh, Sheikh Sidi Mohammed Al-Jamal Rafai Ashadali, um, who um, passed a few years ago. And he was the head of the hired Sufi council in, um, in Jerusalem. He was a teacher at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, uh, Masjid in Jerusalem, who, uh, which is the third holiest site in Islam, um, and lived in Jerusalem all his life. Um, and uh, he's a lineage holder in this particular uh, tariqa, as the word is the, in this lineage of um, of Sufism, and um, he was known quite well in the Muslim world, um, and he was one of the, uh, I think, 50 religious leaders invited to the UN for a pan-religious convocation some years ago. So he's, he, he, he held this um, alignment between um, a formal religious path and the the mystical spiritual path and um the thing i it's hard for me i mean anyone who's had a close teacher uh of that kind of stature um it's hard to put into words what they teach you right it's like he destroyed me utterly in the way that we <laughs> like to be destroyed when we're on the spiritual path and um i think that what he taught me deeply was uh, to trust my own heart and to distrust my ego. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, that the, and that there's this funny discipline of inquiring past the ego to find the deeper heart that... Um, yeah. Yeah. Apply, apply that to me for business. So I can understand. I, I think I know what an ego is and 
I'm not even going to go if I know what spirituality is. But anyway, um, right. yeah, 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 make, yeah, make that yeah. practical for me. Right. The word ego doesn't, doesn't translate entirely because the Arabic word nafs um, doesn't have the same word as, we ha- as the psychological term ego. So it's hard, it's hard to translate it exactly, but it's like the beingness that I've been given in physical form that is apparently separate. Mm. and its own identity. Um, you know, it's like there's a... So in business, uh, what what I have learned over the years with more and more refinement and still many, many mistakes and continuing to refine is, t- is to be able to discern when it's the voice of my nafs and when there is a deeper... A voice or expression of the heart and um, and so in business for instance um, I can hear like this morning oh my god all these details I've got to do all this stuff oh my god I got to do all this stuff and this is probably a more extreme version there's very you know this is something I've been through oh, well, well here's a here's another let me give you an even more clear version is that so in the move to Harrisburg which was really overwhelming logistically as these kinds of city to city moves can be um, uh, especially with an entire family (laughs) you know our kids and everything Um, uh, you know the the, the, I was not you know like I, I could take care of the minimum of my business but I couldn't be as creative and as expansive as I normally am because all this space was taken up and as, and as i found over the years quite normally uh my client list shrunk you know i didn't drop the ball on clients but clients kind of naturally completed and new clients weren't showing up and um you know and there was like there was a dip in the business finances because of that and i have been through this cycle so many times over 20 years that I could really easily discern the voice of my nafs that was saying, Oh my God, you got to work harder. There's the money's going to run out. And I could say, I've been through this. Like, this is not like that. This is not a doomsday thing. This is a temporary thing. As soon as we land and as soon as my energy opens up again and I can do some practical things and my energy is open, it's going to shift again. Mm. And it did. Mm. And it did. Mm. But in the past that panic might have led me to unsustainable work habits to promoting and selling in a pushy way out of panic moving into business um strategies that are unsustainable non-nourishing and not in integrity Mm. um and instead i was able to like and it and then and it and it's it, what happened. Like we had a bunch of new people come into the community. We ha- I had a bunch of new individual clients show up. I'm now full. I can't take any more clients. You know, it's like there's it happened. And even if that hadn't happened, I still could trust that once my energy had opened, I would have had the resilience and creativity to face whatever challenges were there in a more open-hearted way, not in not from panic. So that's, that's an example um, mm-hmm. of, what I, of, of what I mean, yeah. if that makes sense. It does. And I still, want a, I still want a story of one of your Sufi teachers. Any story will go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, let me see. It's like it's – so I had – um, so I had, so, so, um, one of my Sufi teachers, so it's so funny because so many of the teachings that came through, came through for me personally. And then I was kind of given internally about how to apply it to business and less explicitly. Okay. So, so one of my teachers, I remember early in the business, I was trying to um, limit, I was like the business was very new and we were really struggling financially. Um, 
we didn't have kids yet, but we were really struggling. And I, and I was like, okay, but, but I'm only supposed to, you know, like I was taking a very kind of high minded, very high, like, but I should only do this, you know, or I should only see these kinds of clients or I need to be very kind of like my integrity, like my integrity thing, you know, was very up. And a Su one of the Su one of my Sufi teachers who I'd taken a lot of guidance from at that point in my life, um, I was doing, I was seeing him individually for some sessions and um, and mentoring. And he said, you know, when you're hungry, you eat. <laughs> <laughs> and what he was saying was like, don't be so particular. And this was like, this was like a deep teaching. Like we have these lessons about our, uh, like my nafs, our nafs can be very, our ego as I translated, mistranslated, mm -hmm. but our nafs, our physical presence, ourselves can be very tricky. And my particular personality mm -hmm. really holds on to rules and holds on to integrity in a way that actually isn't healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had given myself such high standards that I was holding myself separate mm -hmm. and I was judging other people where people were just being human and there were clients I could see and work that I could do that mm -hmm. was not wrong or bad to do. Mm -hmm. It wasn't wrong or bad to do. And I was holding these high standards and I was keeping opportunity for myself mm -hmm. to care for me and my beloved and to care for the business and to care for these clients. Mm -hmm. And um, in this like phrase of, um, you know, like, uh, you know, like when you're hungry, you, you, <laughs> you know, and there's a Sufi teaching that goes, you know, that's, that's maybe more explicit there. Like your body has certain rights over you. Your body has certain rights over you. Like we have a need to care for ourselves. And um, it's really interesting because um, I was, um, I remember there was a discussion. There was a discussion among a bunch of Sufis and I was on in this discussion. It was an online discussion and people, you know, like in, in Islam, there's a lot put on the um, following the hadith, the example of the Prophet Muhammad. Mm -hmm. It's one of the spiritual practices. It's like, what did the Prophet do? And what can we learn from that? And how can we follow that? Not blindly, but like, how can we, you know, learn from someone who was a deep teacher of the way? And, um, and one of the, one of the people in this, in this discussion said, you know, the, you know, we all take a lot of time and they were a sheikh also. They were like a very high teacher, not just somebody saying it. And I don't mean like we all have agency in this, but somebody, I, somebody who has had a lot of experience on the path. Worries, yeah. And um, said, you know, we spend a lot of time following the hadith, the fadla, you know, the example of the prophet and other spiritual masters after they were attained their prophethood or came into their prophethood. And it's like, are any of us here prophets or saints? <laughs> Maybe we should pay a little bit of attention to what they were doing prior to that. Mm. And the prophet prior to that was a merchant and a trader. Mm -hmm. And he um, uh, was, uh, he had his first wife who passed before he, you know, before him um, was very wealthy woman um, who was the owner of the business. And he came to work for her. And he um, took on like leading caravans and he was the, um, the, um, uh, his nickname was El Alam, you know, Al, Al Amin, which Amin means the trustworthy. And because, you know, in those days when you were, when you did trade, you gave your goods to somebody who put them on a camel and disappeared for months. Right. <laughs> and months. <laughs> allegedly came back to you with what he said he sold them for. And your <laughs> so it, it took a lot of trust to do that. Right. And, um, and he was known as the trustworthy and he built up a very successful business. Mm -hmm. a very, I mean, like she was already successful, but he added to that through um, being deeply in integrity in business. And so, this is like this is a lesson from my teachers about um, both what I said before. When you're hungry, you have to eat. Like it's okay to engage in business. It's okay to engage with worldly things, and 
like how do we balance this it, like the integrity that matters is not the integrity of standing in judgment of other people mm -hmm. but it's the integrity of being in the love with other people of being in right relationship with mm -hmm. other people mm -hmm. and and so this was kind of like a couple of different teachings from different people that kind of came together with something that I think sometimes surprises my students when I break off from talking about spiritual items and say, like, work on your business, like, work on your business. like face this stuff around selling, face this stuff around marketing, like let your heart open to learning the practicalities of it because it's really important that we show up in the world. It's mm -hmm. like, we don't want to just disappear into a cushion. Like spiritual business is not being absent from the world of business. It's like being in the world. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a lot there. Um, and I want to get to, um, not yet, but I want to talk a little bit about Islam in a minute. But um, I, I do, I do want to ask you about sort of the evolution of your own business. You say you've been doing this iteration of your business. I think you said since two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just wondering a little bit. I know a little bit about how it's evolved, but I kind of want to hear it from you. I mean, obviously, you had one way of doing it in in the beginning, and like anything, you you learn you learn things. Mm -hmm. So, what have you learned, and sort of where are you where are you now with it? Oh my God. I don't even know how to begin to answer that question <laughs> without like taking 20 years to talk about it. But um, the, um, you know, I've, I've, um, you know, that lesson that I was talking about before around having standards that are too high because I'm in judgment of other people, like that was a really deep one that helped me evolve the business to allow for more opportunity to come in mm. because, um, just being able to engage with a lot of different types of people. I mean, like, you know, you're talking about diversity, like how much does unconscious bias, mm. you know, feed into questions of integrity, right? Um, and how does that keep us from uh, engaging with people who are different from us or have different paths or different ways of being? Um, uh you know, it's, it's, the, you know, th there's a lot there. One of the ways um, that it has evolved is that I have evolved my business model, or at least the pricing model from one that was mostly teaching around, like, like having set prices to moving into a pay from the heart pricing strategy. That's a big transition, it seems to me. It was a big transition and we experimented with it. I experimented with it in very specific ways for several years before my heart just needed to make that transition. And it's not a transition that I recommend universally for everybody. You know, I think, um, you know, like the path in business can be very unique for each person. Like people need different, me the medicine is different for different people. And so there's no one way that works for everyone. For me, this evolved because uh, for a couple, I think it, it, like our business was able to evolve in this direction for a couple of reasons. One is that over the years, I've cleaned my own stuff with money more and more and more mm -hmm. because a lot of times when I see folks that we work with and how I used to be like a sliding scale or offering clients to pay their own price was often a collapse on the part of the business owner, mm. uh, a refusal to face their own issues around money and to stand in what they know uh, the business needs to be successful to be nourished and cared for and they're like oh pay whatever you want and so what they what that often is is like offloading all of their money stuff onto their client right. i don't want to see what the price is you you pick it because i don't want to face it terrible way to do business <laughs> and a terrible injustice to your client you know um uh, but as I've cleared that stuff and I've gotten really clear on what the business needs, it enabled me to approach this um, pay from the heart place really clearly and cleanly so that it's not a burden on people. Um, also, as my heart um, became more and more aware, I mean, I was an activist from an early age, but it's just like you become more and more aware of the injustice in the capitalist system. 
I needed to be able to create a way for people to approach the help that we're giving without them being shamed in any way. Mm. You know, often when we, when people need help, um, different forms of charity or support, there's a lot of shame and a lot of burden mm. placed on folks. I mean, if you take some of the people who are in our courses, if they're like, I, you know, I, I, just as an example, people who are like single moms um, with kids um, who, who are not getting any support from their exes and they're kind of struggling with all the hoops administratively of like just parenting and trying to run a business and trying to, um, uh, you know, like maybe they're trying to get counseling. So they're, they're like, they're already overwhelmed. They don't need further hoops to jump through, right. apply for help or even to ask for help. Mm. It's just like, boom, you know, like you choose what you can pay. Like this is what we need, but you choose what you can mm. pay. And so it's like, it's for me, it's a piece of, of justice and access around mm. that. Um, and then the third thing is, is that our business has been blessed that I've been around for long enough and I know marketing well enough that our audience is large enough that if there's a handful of people that pay really minimal amounts, we're going to be fine. Mm. We're going to be fine. Um, people with really small audiences, I don't recommend you know, her needing to kind of walk in, you know, so, so there's like an evolution, both in my own understanding and there's an evolution in my business so that the business can support it. And there's an evolution in, you know, in, in all of these different pieces mm. um, in terms of communication, in terms of how all this is done. So this has been a big, big evolution for me. And we still have some things that are set prices. Um, and fewer and fewer, but we still we still have some, and we have some where the minimums, you know, the minimums like pay from the heart doesn't mean pay whatever you want to pay. It doesn't mean that. There's a it it's a it means like we need to all take into account all of our needs and arrive at a price that accounts for all of our needs. And that that to me is a much more kind of mature for me, understanding of what the sliding scale could be. So, Another thing that you've done um, is that you used to, and you still do, um, it used to be sort of like class driven. In other words, like mm -hmm. you, you pay such certain amount for a certain program mm -hmm. and now you have this learning community. So tell me right. a little bit about what that's about or how right. that evolved. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I can't. So the so the evolution of like watching like literally thousands of different business owners owners over the decades, kind of watching them try to develop their business, and because of the way um, these self employed solo businesses develop, here's what people do: is they jump into it not knowing what they're doing. Um, and then they like read a book or read a magazine or take a workshop or do, you know, and they put things in places in place, but there's not really any structure. They're just like, Oh my God, they're just grass. It's like, you've been thrown out of a boat into the water. The boat's been smashed. What piece of wood can you grab onto <laughs> to float? And this is, this is also the kind of emotional <laughs> sense of things. And so when people come to me, come to heart of business, because I've been able to observe this over so long, long, uh, such a length of time, I've managed to observe that there are stages of business development and each stage has certain elements that allow you to solidify like basics before you can kind of go to the next stage and the next stage. And, and, and what was hard for me running courses all the time for like our core teachings is that, people would like, okay, I'm going to buy this course and I'm going to do it. And so there'd be this set amount of information and yet people who came in would need only some portion of it because they read something, you know, in previous years, they'd put some aspect of it in place already. And so parts of it were useful and parts of it were kind of repetition or redundant for what they'd already done. And everyone has different, 
um, things going on in their life, different ways of processing information, different time periods. And so even with a three month course or eventually like a six month course, they come in, in the middle of the six month course, they get sick for a couple of weeks or um, something would come up in the family or there'd be a wedding or a death or some, or, or they just needed time to process because there was emotional content. And so they needed a few more weeks with a certain topic, but nope, we got the syllabus and the course ends and we were marching on. And so people would come out of these courses incomplete in some way. Mm. And I just needed to face the reality of like, how do people actually develop a business? Like what is actually needed in terms of support and learning to develop a business? And so although we still do teach some courses, like some of our intro courses and get to know us courses, you know, and there's some, you know, intensives we do. The main way that people develop through the early stages of business development doesn't really fit in a course structure. <clears throat> they needed a different container, a container that allowed them to go at their own pace, but still gave them support and structure to move and um, gave them access to the information, the information that they needed kind of more in a buffet fashion rather than in a do it in this order fashion. So that's how it kind of evolved. And I finally said, well, let's just, you know, because we don't, we've had online community of one sort or another since 2005. And I said, we just need to, this needs to be our main container. Yes, another th another thing you're un another aspect of it you're sort of underselling um, only because you're so familiar with it. Uh, people that listen to it might not be familiar with it. There's a strong community element about it. Yes, uh, it seems like that that's an important aspect of um, getting support and giving support. Yeah, um, I'm glad you named that because it's like you know when you look at Buddhism. You know, like there's the three jewels of Buddhism, which include um, the Sangha, which is the yeah. you know the community. It's the same in Islam. Like there's, you know, uh, you know, the community, the Ummah is one of the three pillars of support in a community. Body of Christ and, also, uh, Christians, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like we see this in many different things. And it's, the, it's like, it's not so much just a spiritual thing, it's a human thing. Mm. Um, uh, it's the same in the school that our boys go to. Like where our boys are going to a school that uh, they're not segregated by age into like age classes. Mm -hmm. And so older kids can help the younger kids and the younger kids can help the older kids in a free way. There's none of this kind of, oh, you're 10 years old, you're in this grade, you shouldn't associate with people younger mm -hmm. or older than you. And so in the community, people who are in more advanced stages can still get the help because I'm there and you know the learning is there, but they also deepen their own learning by sharing and mentoring and giving feedback to people that are newer mm. and people who are newer don't just hear it from me, which, okay, like I'm not going to give away any of the skill that I have, but sometimes you just need to hear it in a different way. Mm. You know, somebody else, you know, will say it in different words. And it's like, God, I heard that from Mark a million times, but you said it in this way. And I'm like, <laughs> it finally clicked for me, you know? And, um, it's such an important part yeah. as well as also not feeling alone mm -hmm. and seeing other people struggling. So you know that it's not personal to you. It's just the way it is, you know, and um, it's just part of the development. So yeah, thank you for naming that. The community aspect to me feels really, um, uh, really important, mm -hmm. really important part of it. We're, we're almost, we're, we're bumping up our, our hour and the, the, the wise thing to do would give you a simple question to ant to to close with, but uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I was just reading um, something. I was just sort of skimming. Uh, there was a, a psychic Christian psychic named um, Paul Solomon, who's deceased now. Hmm. In one, of, he was a uh, trans person, and in one of his readings, he was talking about sort of the destiny of Islam. And um, we don't need to go really talk, talk about what Paul said, because I didn't read it <laughs> all that much, but it's almost like, um, it's, it's an interesting place that Islam is right now, you know? So for most people in the Western world, it's this kind of like um, bastard child or something. They don't know what to do with it, you know? So I'm wondering, and I know this is a big question, what is your thought as to what the, what the destiny of Islam is right now, or what it has to offer the larger world? It is so such an interesting question. We could do a whole hour 
on this. And um, ah, what, what, what do I want to say to that? So um, there have been a number of people in the um, in the Muslim world that are uh, that I've heard say, you know, from a mystical perspective and also from an Islamic perspective, both. Um, not that they're mutually exclusive, but I mean, from a, you know, that has said like the rebirth, the renewal of Islam will come from the West. Hmm. Um, uh, and this is not to say like culturally, you know, it's like that's, that can be a very colonialist perspective, but it, it, and so like there's problems also with saying that, but I, I think that there, I think that what um, any, every religion carries a certain kind of flavor to it, right? Like there's an intimacy of the personal nature of the connection to the divine that Christianity brings, right? The personal connection with the, you know, like almost like a human side. And like, we don't want to personalize or anthropomorphize, uh, you know, God, but that like the concept of Christ or the being of Christ, like that's a very personal intimate nature and it's like in the Quran it says I'm closer to you than your jugular vein there's this intimate nature of the divine that we need access to you know Buddhism and I'm just grabbing grab bag you know, like there's so many different examples of this right Buddhism has this sense of like okay like we need to not be so attached to the material world mm -hmm. you know like there's like this can you know that this this um distance we need from the material world because we're filling up that place that needs to connect with something different. Um, that's such a, such a piece. Like, and, and so Islam, the very meaning of Islam, like the word Muslim, like the, the Islam was not a separate religion at the time of the prophet. The prophet, um, that didn't really come in for another couple hundred years um, after his death. You know, he just saw the, like, the, the understanding is, like, we're all people of the book. Like, the, the Quran says, I just came to confirm what came before. Like, the divine, the oneness has sent prophets to every age and every people and every community. There wasn't supposed to be, like, a separate, different religion so to speak in the way that the western world understands religion but what the word muslim means is one who is surrendered one who submits one who surrender yeah is surrendered to the oneness to the source of love and um and i think that the special um flavor that islam is bringing at this time of like climate degradation and colonialism and capitalism run amok and all of this is that the human being needs to be humble. Mm. We need to surrender. We need to surrender our sense of control, our sense that somehow we're the lords of creation. Mm -hmm. We need to surrender. And I think this is a really deep, profound, necessary medicine mm. for humanity mm. because there is so much that we need to let go of in our current modern life. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's well said. Well said, Mark. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I could talk to you for another hour, um, but uh, I'm going to just tell little people a little bit about the network and, uh, and then I'll say formally goodbye to you. <clears throat> um, first of all, if you want to know more about the network, there's a couple of ways to do so. The simplest way is to join our private Facebook group, which you can find on diversityandspirituality.com. On the third Saturday of every month, we have an online community gathering. You could find out more about that by going to our website and looking for events. And also, if you want to support us, you can support us on Patreon. Go to Patreon, look for Diversity and Spirituality Network, and you can do so. Um, Mark, it's an enormous uh, pleasure and honor. I'm just so happy to know you and to have discovered you and get, get to know you a little bit and um, to, to share you with, with other people. So. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being my guest and uh, you know, it, it's been great. I'm so delighted and grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. And ah, I love your heart and your presence and it's, um, it's really inspiring. I look forward to a lot more with you. Thank you, Mark.